Good afternoon, my name is uh, Dave Norton from Discovering New England History. And for this uh, new show right here, we're gonna discover and get involved in uh, genealogy and specifically a steamer trunk. So we'll begin with slide number one. And that is what is called a steamer trunk. And it's uh, what they used back in the uh, 1865 to probably 1904, something like that, when uh, folks traveled uh, from one town to another or from one country to another. That's what they used. It was a, a steamer trunk. Now, what I had was um, when my uh, grandmother died, I had uh, the only thing I wanted out of her house, which I was really fascinated with, was that there was this uh, old trunk underneath a workbench. And this trunk was all, uh, it was really a mess. It was all full of uh, scrap lumber and all, all kinds of things like that. And it was all rusty, it had an outer casing on it, it was all rusty and whatever. And I, but I saw some possibilities on it. And so I um, reconditioned that and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. So we'll go to the next slide. And all of a sudden I had this idea. I said, you know, my daughter does, uh, she's a school teacher in Plainville, Massachusetts, and she's involved in all the family uh, genealogy. And I thought I'd begin here to talk about what is genealogy. Uh, first, you have a definition, it's a study of family history, and she's very much involved in that. And what do you need to get started? Well, documents you really need to, uh, to prove uh, on the family tree where everyone, all your ancestors are, are uh, birth certificates, marriage certificates, and federal census records. So that's what you do to get started here. And we'll go to the next slide. And places to search. Uh, on your uh, discovery, you can search uh, town halls, town, county records, state archives, national archives, genealogical societies, historical societies, libraries, cemeteries, and, and also very helpful is online or ancestry.com. Now, if you go to the next slide, and this is what uh, she developed here. Martin Hansen came over from uh, Oslo, Norway uh, in 1876, and he's my great grandfather. And we, no one in the family really knew much about him at all. And she did all this research with all the uh, birth certificates and all the records and traced it all the way back. And his daughter was uh, Sophia Hansen Chapman, which was my grandmother. And she had a daughter, Hazel Chapman Norton. That's my mother. There I am, Dave Norton. And uh, my daughter, Kate Kelly, and my son, Christopher Norton, and my grandson, Grant Kelly. Now, if you had this, um, say, around Thanksgiving time or something like that, you got all the family together, and then you, you show them genealogy, a nice uh, tree and a show where everyone is like that, uh, a lot of people immediately head out for the kitchen or head out to the backyard. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it, it's very interesting if you're into it, but to try to get other family members interested, it's very difficult, believe me. So I came up with this idea of using a uh, steamer trunk as sort of a, a vehicle, and let's, let's trace the steamer trunk on the journey from Oslo, Norway, all the way through to uh, the United States, and maybe that would be a better way to approach this uh, geneal genealogy. So we'll go to the next slide. And once again, there's that steamer trunk. It's really interesting because it, um, you know, a lot of people say if you have an antique uh, piece of furniture or something like that, um, the worst thing you can do is, uh, uh, you know, rehabilitate it, square it away, uh, redo it. <laughs> Just leave it, along, leave it alone. It has more value if you don't touch it. Believe me, this, uh, this trunk that I had, um, if I put it out on the uh, trash day in the front yard, no one would even take it. That's how bad it was. It was all completely rusty. Some of the metal casing was... Uh, was bent and uh, it, it was really a mess. And to restore it, it took me a lot of time, just a, just a project. Um, basically, at this, you can see all the, the silver on the, on the casing there, that all had to be done, all the rust taken off with a very small brush painstakingly taken off. All the wood, I um, refinished it. Everything on there is original. 
So I didn't add anything to it. And you can see in the center the, where the, uh, actually the lock was, that was ripped off a long time ago. Um, so I did a repair, put it all together, something more presentable. And the next th item what I want to do is find out, wait a minute, the only information I have on this trunk was what my grandmother said. She said it came over from uh, my great-grandfather from Oslo, Norway in 1876. That's it. There's nothing on the trunk. It's just very uh, somewhat of an ordinary trunk. There's nothing on it that says any date, nothing on it that says it came from Norway. So how do you really date that to really, in this day and age, of course, you're trying to prove uh, anything that uh, you discover like that. So we'll go to the next slide. And I said, well, first of all, let's see if this is a trunk of that, of that period. <clears throat> so I searched on the internet, and those are some of the, uh, <coughs> some of the typical trunks um, back in the day. And those are the typical styles had what they call a barrel stav trunk, where you can see the, the straps on the top are going from left to right. And you have a humpback trunk on the top in the center. And you can see that's rounded from the front, front to the back. It goes on and also from side to side. You have a flat top, which of course they're easy to stack. Then you have a round top where you don't have the um, characteristics of the hump on the, on the top. And the camelback, which is the, uh, the most sought after one by collectors, the difference between the camelback and a humpback, which I researched, if you take a close look, on the camelback, there's a center piece on it that uh, reinforcing right smack in the center going from front to back. On the humpback, there's not. You can see there's nothing right in the center. And that's the difference. And a bevel top, where it goes uh, <clears throat> from one side to the other side to stray, but it's beveled on the, uh, instead of uh, completely round on the top. So basically, when you, when you would take a look at my trunk, the camelback is the one that really most closely matches. In terms of the color and, and whatever, the humpback has got the right color. Uh, you can see it's the black metal casing. Um, it's all got a wood, a pine wood construction on the inside, and the whole thing is completely cased in metal. And you can see it's got the uh, silver on the top, and it's got all the, uh, you know, it's painted gray on the, uh, the casing. So now I've, I've pretty much got it down pretty good. So we'll go to the next slide. Now, on that casing, the silver part of it, this is on the Hansen trunk. After I cleaned it all up, I took a, uh, photograph of that. You can see you've got leaves, you've got flowers, you've got, uh, it's quite, uh, quite a, an ornate uh, pattern. And I said, well, wait a minute. Maybe there's somewhere I could do some research on the internet and find out if uh, someone has a list or maybe even some pictures of the typical casing patterns uh, back in time. So we'll go to the next slide. And these are probably the eight most uh, uh, significant uh, patterns that they used on these uh, manufacturing of these trunks. And basically it said it's from the period 1865 to 1900. And of course I know from the uh, genealogical research that uh, 1876 is when Martin Hansen, my great grandfather, came over. Now if you take a look at those, if you take a look at the top row second in from the left, it just struck me. I said, my gosh, this is exactly a Exactly it. That's it. That's the take casing pattern, and it dates the trunk in that right period of time. And you can see the other patterns are very good, but they're not as uh, not as ornate. They're not as uh, well crafted as the um, as the one on top. So we'll go to the next slide, and I compared them. On the left is the Hanson trunk. That's the one I did had for 1876, and on the right is the that typical pattern from 1865 to 1900. So doing this investigation, uh, historical, if you will, or genealogical, if you will, you can see it's just, uh, it's just a dead-on type of a casing. And they said basically they're no longer manufactured and all the patterns uh, do not exist today. So that was part of my effort on this trunk to try to uh, substantiate where it was from. And we'll go to the next slide. And there it is. You can see on the see that same pattern is done right on the uh, the front of the trunk. 
And we'll go to the next slide. Now, what I tried to do, which is the beauty of the internet, is search Oslo, Norway. I know we came over in 1876. We have uh, those records. And I said, well, what does it really look like? I don't want, uh, you know, pictures of what today's Oslo looks like. I want to see what it, does it look like back in the time. So in terms of this uh, genealogical uh, investigation, I wanted to try to take you back in time, take you back where the trunk was, and l let's see if I can trace this through. So here's a t actually a fascinating picture here, and it happened to be Oslo, Norway in 1876. So you can see the very mountainous, you can see the small, small town type of thing. My great-grandfather, Martin, he was uh, 33 years old, and um, we found out he's a tool and die maker, and he was single, and he just said, I, I want to go to America. And back, back then, uh, Norway was becoming overpopulated. And back in Norway, back, back at the time, they, um, the government held uh, all the land. You couldn't own your own land. And there was quite a few restrictions on freedom. So Martin said, I, you know, I, I have some trade skills, whatever. I just want to leave Norway and start up my new future. So if you can imagine that. And basically, they had only all your possessions are almost con really confined to just one trunk. And let's look into it. How do we get across to go to America? And so that was the trunk that he, that he took. If you can imagine all your possessions in that small trunk. So we'll go to the next slide. And I found this out. I was more really interested in the, in the, in the trunks here. And here's a picture of a typical steamer trunk factory. Now, some of these trunks were manufactured in Norway, and some were manufacturing actually in New England. So there is a, certainly another uh, New England connection. And um, this particular, particular picture, I believe, uh, was uh, from some place in uh, New Hampshire where they were making trunks. And of course, obviously, they were selling them to all the, the people that were going to go to Europe or coming back, back home here. Um, it, was, it was quite a business back, back, in, uh, back in the day. So we'll go to the next slide. And this is an excellent picture, too. It's a Trump fact trunk factory, and it's actually in uh, uh, somewhere up in uh, New England, north, northern New England. And you can see there's all the group there, some of their trunks in the front. But what really strikes me that those are the workers in the factory. If you take a look at the, uh, the top two rows, look how young those, uh, those boys are. <laughs> Back then, there was no uh, child labor laws. So if you had to support your family, uh, if you were nine or 10 years old, you learned to trade and that's it. You didn't go to school, they sent you out into a, into a factory and that's what you did. You did all this, all, this, uh, all this work in manufacturing. That's what it was back then. That's, that's quite, a, quite a sight. We'll go to the next slide. And now I'm, what I'm trying to do is go step by step uh, for the family to see, okay, let, let's, let's see how this works. Um, um, and here's a picture in Norway. You can see some of the women there, they are got some of their belongings. What they did was they, they put them on a cart just to take them down to the uh, steamer ship. You can see they got a, some people have spinning wheels or whatever. They may not be able to take this all on a ship, but they uh, put it all on. Uh, young woman there, she's got a, a basket, sort of a backpack type of, type of thing, as much as you can try to carry, and they're loading up a cart ready to go down to the steamship in, uh, in the port of Oslo, Norway. We'll go to the next slide. And this is one of my favorite shots. You can see the steamership, there's a stack there with the smoke coming out. You can see a horse and wagon taking a lot of these trunks and uh, possessions down to the steamer, steamership. And that was taken uh, probably 1875, 78 in Norway, so to give you an idea of what they had. And this was kind of on the, uh, technology was changing. We were going from uh, sailing ships or schooners to uh, steamships. And this was a, this happened to be a particular uh, steamship. And uh, that's, that's quite a uh, process here. And we'll go to the next slide. And that's a great picture. Look at all the people on the dock. What they did is they, uh, <laughs> 
they took, uh, I guess, took a number probably, and one by one you would uh, load on the, on the ship, and if uh, the cutoff for the number of passengers they needed, then you just didn't make that ship. You had to wait for the next ship. And, of course, all family and friends would come on the dock, too. That's probably what a lot of those folks are there in the dock, just to say goodbye. And uh, some of the uh, Norwegians left part of their family there, and they were going to settle in America, and then they would get settled and probably uh, have the rest of their family come over. It, it was quite, uh, quite an immigration uh, that happened back in the period. It was after the American Civil War. Uh, during the Civil War, there was uh, uh, not a lot of immigration, as you could probably understand that. And after the war was over in 1865, all the people from Europe, that's where they wanted to come, to America. So we'll go to the next slide. And that's another great, uh, great picture there of the early uh, steamer ship. And we'll go to the next slide. And this is a great picture. It's a cross-section of the uh, inside of a steamer ship. And you can see on the top they had, uh, you know, some bunks on there, a couple of trunks, not too many. Uh, basically, the people had to sit on benches. And down below, if you take a look, there's stacks and stacks of these trunks. And, um, of course, they had probably rocks for ballast on, on the bottom and also these trunks. You can see how they stacked them all up for the trip. They had to go across the North Sea to get to the eastern coast of uh, England. So we'll go to the next slide. And that's, that's a picture of the uh, Norwegians. You can see between decks, they, uh, all they had to do, that's it, just sit on a bunk, on a, uh, uh, either a bunk bed or, or sit on a bench. And uh, there you go. Um, and, and back in time, they, the ships just came, came coming. There was no uh, weatherman to tell you if there was going to be a great storm in the North Sea. <laughs> It didn't matter. You just set out, and whatever happened, happened. It was you were really at the uh, uh, Mother Nature uh, <laughs> had control of that, and you really didn't know what you're heading off into. And we'll go to the next picture, and there's a picture of that same steamer boat leaving Oslo, Norway, heading across the North Sea. Now, what I tried to do is you can take a lot of um, uh, a lot of pictures of, uh, or photographs, whatever, of uh, the map to trace the route. And I try to uh, reconstruct it myself so you can basically see exactly what the, what the route was. And what was interesting is that when I did my research, uh, the Norwegians came over only one way. So it wasn't like they, uh, they came over to America um, on different routes, and then you would never know exactly which route they, they took. So I feel pretty good in history that uh, this is the way Martin Hansen would come across to America. So we'll go to the next slide. And I drew this map. It, it works a lot better when you try to um, describe this when you um, basically trace over a map that you have on an atlas and uh, just put down the key, uh, probably the key countries and trace the route. And you can see up on the right hand corner on the top, you can see Oslo. So that's where the steamship would be. And it would have, his, have to make its way across the North Sea to the, point, to the port of uh, Kingston upon Hull on the eastern coast of uh, England. And we're going to go step by step through this. And then from there, they would um, stay and pick up a train to go across from Hull to Liverpool. And then from there, they would take a, uh, another ship and sail across the Atlantic Ocean to America. This was the uh, primary route that the Norwegians came, and they would actually purchase a, uh, a ticket, which would include the, uh, the ship from uh, Oslo across the North Sea, the train ticket from Hull to Liverpool, <coughs> and your second steamer ship ticket all the way across. It was all, all together. So we'll go to the next slide. <coughs> now, Kingston upon Hull, uh, was quite a port, eastern coast of England. And by doing some research on that, I found out that during this period of time, probably seven years, uh, 1876 or so, in seven years in that whole, that whole period of time, uh, the records said there were like um, 900,000 Norwegians came across on that route. 
And there's the picture of uh, unloading there at the uh, eastern coast of England. We'll go to the next slide. And here's once again the uh, eastern coast and Hull. A lot of famous, uh, a lot of sharp buildings there. You can see that one there. That's what they call a custom house. You can see the, uh, the towers on it. And we'll go to the next slide. And that's what it looks like today. <laughs> I uh, did, did some of that research, and I said, well, it's, very, it's a predominant building. Maybe it still exists today, and there it is. You can see the, uh, the towers and the structure. And that's what they call the custom house in Hull, where a lot of the folks from uh, Norway um, had a pass through. We'll go to the next slide. And in Hull, this is what they call the Wilson Line headquarters. Now, at that at that time, it, it stated that the Wilson line, of course, was the shipping line that goes from uh, uh, Oslo, Norway, all the way across to uh, the eastern coast of England and back to Norway and back and forth. You can imagine, uh, in the course of that period in time, over 900,000 Norwegians took that. And the Wilson line became, the, uh, in history, the largest uh, shipping, privately owned shipping line uh, in, the, in the world at that time. And that building still exists. It's a brick building there in uh, Hull, England. That was quite, a, quite an enterprise. We'll go to the next slide. And after coming across to the port, you had to get into the, uh, make your way to the Hull Paragon Railroad Station, which is a short distance from, uh, from, from where the ship would dock. And that's a picture of what it looked like uh, back in the, uh, uh, the late 1800s. And we'll go to the next picture. And now we have what they call the emigrant waiting room. What happened here on the, on the first, uh, first year, the first bringing all the Norwegians over, they, 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 um, all the men and, uh, would get off the ship. And while they're waiting for the train or whatever, they would just, you know, go about town, get something to eat, something to drink or whatever. And, um, but the problem was uh, the English um, would uh, prey upon all these uh, Norwegians. The men, they would corner them in the alley, knock them down, take, rob them, take their wallets, uh, uh, beat them up, if you will. Um, it was a real problem. And, and, and the women, of course, uh, to protect them, they, they kept them... Uh, they had to stay on the ship. And then they finally come up with this, what they call a, a waiting room, which they built. And the reason they did that is because the immigrants came over and they were really unchecked uh, medically and they spread cholera all over England. And it was such a problem that they really didn't know what to do. So they come up with this idea of building these uh, waiting rooms there. You couldn't stay there overnight but it was a place to uh, maybe wash up a little bit and uh, off, once you get off the boat before you can pick up the train. And this way they would not let you, the Norwegians, uh, get out and walk around the town of uh, Hull. They had to do something to contain the, these people here while they're waiting for the train. So they would just stay in this, uh, uh, what they call emigrant waiting room. So we'll go to the next slide. Now this is actually, <laughs> a, a picture I took here, it's actually a British train that once again made, made it across uh, from the east coast to the west coast of uh, Liverpool, England. And they would load the train up with the passengers and the last three cars, they would put all these steamer trunks in it. And of course, here's my uh, <laughs> great grandfather's trunk, if you can imagine that, and one of the last, just throwing in one of the last three cars, here he is all by himself, 33 years old, heading across uh, England. The train only made a trip once a day. They said it, uh, it left at 11 o'clock in the morning at uh, Hull on the eastern coast of uh, England. And it took them four hours to go across England to Liverpool. So that's quite a, uh, quite a journey. And then the next day they would take, take the folks from, uh, from Norway out of another one. Another trip, would, a boat would stop. And of course the boats kept on coming, so you had a they had to make sure this train ran, ran all the time, and that's how they did it, to get them to Liverpool. Go to the next slide. And I really like this picture. This is what uh, Liverpool, England looked like in 1876. 
And if you take a look there, left side of the, of the picture, you can see here's the railroad line where that train and my, uh, my trunk would go all the way down through the center of uh, Liverpool, and uh, that's the custom house over there on the right. And then if you take a look on the right, sort of in the middle there, you can see there's the, uh, there's the ocean right on the dock. So that's uh, in Liverpool, England in 1876. We'll go to the next picture. And you can see what a busy place that was with all these people coming over. Um, you can see you got an overhead railroad track there, and you've got another railroad track uh, down at the ground level. And that's a very, very interesting sketch. And it shows all the hustle and bustle. You can see a lot of the, uh, <clears throat> the trunks are put on uh, wagons, probably to take from the train station, from the ship to the train station. And uh, it was quite, quite a place back there. And you go to the next slide. And that's one of my favorite. I, I just can't believe how, uh, how sharp and clear that picture actually came out. You can see on, on the building there on the left, it says Overhead Railway, and that was it. That's in Liverpool, so the train would go there, stop. You would go back at the last three cars, pick up your trunk, then drag them, have to take it down the, uh, the stairway right to the street level. And there you are by yourself in uh, Liverpool, England. And we'll go to the next slide. And there's a custom house. And that's looking from, or probably from one of the ships looking back at Liverpool. Very prominent building. And once again, I uh, did a search to see if that building still existed today. And sure enough, I found it. So we'll go to the next slide. And there it is. That's the old uh, custom house. So it's, we're going to uh, stop right here on uh, episode one. But I'm trying to show you what you can do with uh, simple uh, genealogy study for your family. You can actually go on the internet and develop a, uh, some of the pictures back in the time, a slideshow. And believe me now, all of a sudden, it really opens it up to all your family members and cousins, and they can remember some stories there and there. And I'll show you how you can put those all together to make uh, genealogy, to uh, bring it to life, bring history back to life, and uh, find out everything about your family uh, uh, ancestors. So once again, Dave Norton from Discovering uh, New England History. And I hope you enjoyed this show. Have a good afternoon.